Okay, I have that it's five o'clock. So I'm going to uh, call this August 3rd meeting of the Utility Services Board uh, to order. And um, uh, first item on the agenda is approval of the minutes of the previous meeting. And uh, were there any uh, uh, changes or uh, comments regarding the minutes? Okay, I actually, actually had one and that was, uh, let me find it here. Um, uh, in approving the, um, uh, on page two, uh, uh, in approving the refunds, customer refunds, uh, it states that Kepler asked about a $954.32 refund to Centerstone for a leak and wanted clarification on why it was issued for water and not wastewater. I just want to clarify that. I was asking uh, why that refund was issued for water since we're not typically allowed to refund on a water bill. So I just wanted to make that one correction. Um, were there any other modifications to the minutes from last meeting? Okay, and seeing none, is there a motion to approve the minutes with that uh, amendment? So moved. Second. All right, and Latrina, can you please call the roll? Sherman? Yes. Kapler? Yes. Burnham? Yes. Parmenter? Yes. Bannock? Yes. Eamon? Yes. Okay, minutes are approved. Uh, next up our standard invoices uh, in the amount of $891,162.11. Are there any questions about the standard invoices or comments? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve the standard invoices? So moved. Second. Uh, Latrina, please call the roll. Parmenter? Yes. Burnham? Yes. Bannock? Yes. Kepler? Yes. Eamon? Yes. Thurman? Yes. Okay, invoices are approved. Next up are utility bills in the amount of $6,932.75. Uh, any questions on utility bills? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. And Latrina? Panic? Yes. Parmenter? Yes. Sherman? Yes. Eamon? Yes. Burnham? Yes. Kepler? Yes. All right, utility bills are approved. Next up are wire transfers in the amount of $360,157.21. Uh, any questions on wire transfers? All right, seeing none, is there a motion to approve wire transfers? No move. Second. Uh, Latrina, please call the roll. Eamon? Yes. Burnham? Yes. Bannock? Yes. Sherman? Yes. Kapler? Yes. Parmenter? Yes. Okay, wire transfers are approved. Uh, next up is the uh, approval of the consent agenda, and I'll turn this over to Vic Kelson. Oh, make your you're muted. There you go. Every time. <laughs> uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm pleased to present tonight's consent agenda. We have several items, all totaling $66,961. The first is to Suez Analytical Instruments, $8,661.15 for an organic carbon analyzer. Presidio Infrastructure Systems, $13,303.85 for security camera repairs at the service center. Mitchell and Stark for $5,000 for installation of a piping section on the belt press at Blue Pool. Uh, Johnson Control Fire Protection, uh, $8,000 per year that's on call protection services. And then another $5,808 for annual fire inspection of all of the sites uh, that CBU has. Toric Engineering for $11,188 for repair and installation of the cellular connection uh, at our West Booster Station, and the last to Frakes Engineering for $15,000 a year 
that's for on-call engineering services. Uh, does any board member wish to hear any of these items separately from the others? Hearing none, if there's no opposition, the consent agenda will be approved as recommended by staff. I hear no opposition, so the uh, consent agenda is approved. Thanks so much. Thank you, Vic. Uh, next item is uh, an update on the Lake Monroe Watershed, Watershed Management Plan. And uh, we're gonna hear from Maggie Sullivan. Hi, Maggie. Hey, thank you. Uh, hopefully you all got to look at the document I included in the packet, but for the benefit of the public, I'll just run through very briefly. Uh, our big focus has been starting our water sampling program. So we've been sampling the three major streams that flow into Lake Monroe, uh, North Fork, Middle Fork, and South Fork of Salt Creek, along with Crooked Creek, and then the tailwaters of the lake. That started in April and will continue monthly for a year. We've been collecting samples at three points in the lake starting in May, and that'll continue through September every month. Uh, and then our big project that we're gearing up to is we'll be doing what we call our watershed sampling blitz on Friday, September 18th. We're hoping to get about 100 volunteers to come out and collect water samples from 125 sites, uh, smaller streams throughout the watershed. So we're really excited about that. We've got about 40 volunteers signed up so far. I'm hopeful we'll get a few from IU once they're back in session as well. Uh, and then you guys are probably more aware than I am that uh, CBU is doing some additional storm team sampling. Last I heard they've been out twice. They probably have been out again since then. I don't know, Vic or uh, James might be able to speak to that. James? We have not, we didn't go out this weekend. Okay, but we're really excited to see that data because that'll give us a really good feel for how things change when there's a big storm event, we're pretty sure there's a lot more sediment that moves through and that'll be really useful information as we're doing modeling to try to see what's coming into the lake. Um, there's also a project going on in Brown County. The Brown County Regional Sewer District is doing a bunch of sampling looking for E. coli. They're looking in the Lake Mineral Watershed and the Bean Blossom Watershed and they're gonna be doing source analysis as well to try and identify if the source is human or cow or horse or wild creatures. And so that'll be really good information that we hope to have uh, later this fall. Um, a lot of our outreach has been challenging with the pandemic going on, but I am very excited that we got approval to put up signs that say entering the Lake Monroe watershed at eight spots in Monroe County. And we'll be working on getting additional signs put in in Brown County and in Jackson County. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so that's the big things going on right now. And we are looking at how we can do uh, work with schools this fall is really a big question mark as we figure out what's going on with that. Um, and yeah, so I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has but I just really wanted to touch base and let you know what's going on. Amanda, did you have a question? Yeah, I had a question. I was looking through the materials. I, you said you're still looking for volunteers. How yes. do volunteers get involved? So at friendsoflakemonroe.org, we've got a lot of information up there, including a Google sign-up sheet. Uh, so this is actually, it's co-run between Friends of Lake Monroe and the IU Limnology Lab. And so they're doing a lot of the logistics, but there's a spot there with a bunch of information for anyone who wants to sign up. So www.friendsoflakemonroe.org. And yes, thank you for spreading the word. Yeah, and um, just to follow up on that, Maggie, uh, are we just, should we be advertising this on social media and, and such to send volunteers that way? Okay, thank yep. you. Yeah, all you want, that'd be great. And Jeff, you had a, a comment or question. Yeah, well, this has been advertised in the, in our local, <clears throat> excuse me, local newspaper. Um, so I've seen that, that's great. Um, I was wondering about the status of, it was either a <clears throat> gauging station, excuse me, a little peanut bit is stuck in my throat. That's what I get for snacking. Um, 
uh, we, we either contributed to a gauging station or a flow monitoring device, mm -hmm. uh, maybe $15,000, something like that, uh, a few months back. I was wondering what the status of that is. So the gauging station was installed near Kurtz on the South Fork of the Salt Creek. That went in in January. So we've had continuous flow measurements since then. Um, and that is where the storm team, the CBU storm team is collecting samples when they go out. So Perfect. we'll be able to correlate those results to the flow. We had originally hoped to get what's called a super gauge, which actually does chemistry measurements in addition to flow measurements. Um, we did, were not able to do that. It was a much larger funding requirement than what we could pull together. And so that's part of the reason the storm team is collecting these samples and getting them analyzed. We'll complement that information. It's not, doesn't quite uh, substitute, but it'll give us some of that information for modeling purposes. Um, and then the USGS is working, they're the ones who run the stream gauge on a regression curve so that we can use the data from Kurtz to also know what's happening at Mommy a little bit further downstream. Uh, they didn't want to put a gauge in at Mommy because it often gets to be backwater from the lake. Mm -hmm. If there's a big impoundment, that, that part of the stream actually stops flowing. And so the Kurtz is far enough away that it won't be affected by uh, high lake levels, but we are doing a lot of sampling at Maumee because it's uh, more accessible and it catches more of the streams coming in. So it gives a better idea of what's really going into the lake. Does that answer all your questions? Absolutely, thank you for the update as well. Sure. Yeah. I can vouch for the high uh, turbidity and the storm events at Kurtz. I actually drove over there on Sunday morning and uh, it was because we were getting information from the gauge that it was really high. So it was, uh, I went by, I've got some pictures I took. So it was the highest I've seen it. And Yeah, uh, Sherry got some video right after the station was put in in January and it's almost unbelievable how much water moves through there and definitely some turbidity going on. Yeah, a lot. <clears throat> Any other uh, questions or comments for Ma Maggie? I, I had just one. Um, I know that there, there's there been concern about the DNR forestry project and part of the watershed that is going to include some uh, uh, logging and some burns, uh, controlled burns. And I can't remember when that was actually supposed to get started, but um, uh, are there any updates on, you know, uh, any potential effects on our watershed? and uh, sampling that will be catching any changes from that? So I think the project you're talking about is the Houston South um, proposed mm -hmm. logging. And that's not, it hasn't been a, uh, there are several court cases in process for that right okay. now. And so I believe it's on hold. I'm not 100% sure, but they had not projected to start for a while yet. Uh, we've looked into trying to do some additional sampling in that area, but I don't think the timing is going to work out with this project. It's definitely something Friends of Lake Monroe is keeping an eye on. And as I said, there's a, a court case uh, in place trying to, trying to stop that project. And so that's still winding its way through and okay. see what happens. And okay. Those are federal lands. That's that's the U.S. Forest Service, not... not Correct. The... Yeah, I'm sorry, not DNR. It's uh, oh, U.S. Forest okay. Service, Hoosier National Forest. Ah, thanks for the clarification. All right, excellent. Well, thank you very much for the update. Um, that's really helpful and, and we'll get the word out for uh, getting volunteers. I might actually look at that myself. Great, so thank you so much. Excellent. All right, thank you. All right, um, next up we've got a request for approval uh, by resolution on the debt incursion by the Lake Lemon Conservancy District for the dredging project. And Adam Casey is gonna talk with us about this. Hello everybody, um, if you don't know me, I'm Adam Casey with uh, Lake Lemon District Manager out here. I also have Patricia Zelmer um, on the call. She's our bond counsel of Ice Miller. With turbidity being an issue at all the lakes around here, we have had an in-house dredging operation since 2008. Uh, we remove about 10 to 12,000 cubic yards per year of sediment with our dredging operation. We've noticed that we really need to kind of step up um, by really an order of magnitude on sediment removal. So we've been working on a sediment management project that will be utilizing hydraulic dredging in the Eastern Bay where Bean Blossom Creek comes into the lake. 
We're looking at a bond issue to finance this, which will be capped at $1.2 million. Um, the hydraulic dredging will take place in the Delta and we'll actually be using two disposal sites potentially on South Shore Drive. Um, one of the disposal sites is a piece of property that we recently purchased last fall, a 14 acre piece, and we'll be creating a seven acre disposal site on that. Um, the permitting is already in for that. We also have potential permit to utilize an overflow pond and actually plant it to create a treatment wetland. I don't believe we'll need to use the pond and create the wetland for this round, um, but we are hoping to move up to 120,000 cubic yards of sediment with this project. So about a 10 to 12 years worth of work. Now per our contract with the city of Bloomington Utilities, our 50 year lease, we do need to get approval to incur any significant debt and to start any substantial projects. This bond would be funded from our special benefits tax um, and would not be any type of lien on property that the CBU owns or any of the Lake Lemon properties. Um, I do have Patricia Zellmer if we have any more questions directly with the bonding or if we have questions about the project, I'm happy to help. Um, part of this project will also be opening up utilizing our current dredging operation past flow paths in the bean blossom delta. So we do have these high sediment laden flows, we can actually spread them out through the existing delta and enhance the capture capability of the delta there. Okay, great. Um, are there any questions uh, for Adam about this project? Yes, Jeff. To see you again. Um, my question is for Chris Wheeler, uh, and I'm wondering what, if any, exposure we have uh, for this project. None whatsoever. That's what I wanted to hear. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so my understanding is that uh, we need a motion for approval of this debt incursion. Uh, is that correct? Correct. Okay, correct. Uh, is there such a motion? So move. Second. And Latrina, please uh, call the roll. Hepler. Yes. Sherman. Yes. Eamon. Yes. Burnham? Yes. Carmen, sir? Yes. Bannock? Yes. All right. Uh, that is approved. Thank you very much, Adam. All right. Thank you very much. And Maggie, I look forward to some of that source collection data in the Bean Blossom Creek. We should uh, stay in touch about that. But thank you, everybody, and have a good day. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much. Okay, next item, item number seven, request for approval of a second amendment to the agreement with Donahue and Associates uh, on the Jordan Culvert Reconstruction Project. And uh, Jane Pleig is gonna speak with us about this. Jane? Uh, yes, thank you. Yes, this is the second amendment for our contract with Donahue and Associates for the Jordan Culvert Project. We've been working on this since 2013, so I can't say that I'm surprised to see uh, a couple of amendments come in for their contract. Um, this is in the total amount of $39,900. That is for utility coordination, some additional coordination with primarily the two other large public utilities, Duke and Vectron have taken, uh, uh, sorry, Duke and AT&T have taken quite some time uh, for our utility coordination. There's also some uh, additional right-of-way and easement research that's necessary. And Vectron is prepared to do their relocation, but they've asked for a little bit of staking to be done in advance of the project. So that includes um, about $3,300 for our uh, consulting engineer to stake right away for Vectron so that they can get started. It also includes some construction services that will happen once we uh, put the project out to bid. That's for um, review of shop drawings. This is a complicated project. so review of shop drawings, um, answering uh, questions, um, and they've just estimated an amount of time for that. It will only be paying for the actual build time. Whatever they put in, we will pay for up to this uh, maximum amount. So again, it's a contract amendment for $39,900, and I would like to see your approval. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Are there any uh, questions for Jane or comments? 
All right, seeing, oh, Jeff, yes. Um, how is the utility coordination going uh, after getting our, um, our extra layer of attorney uh, on this? Uh, I, 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 I remember that we, we hired on someone uh, in addition to Chris, and I'm wondering if that um, helped move things along any. I'll let Chris answer that. Hi, Chris Wheeler with City Legal. Yes, uh, we are under contract with uh, Denton's Green Bomb out of Indianapolis, um, and more specifically, Dave McGimsey, um, to do some additional research and put together a uh, letter that will be issued to Duke uh, for them to reconsider their position. We had a, um, a meeting with the attorneys at Denton's um, about a week and a half ago, two weeks now maybe, um, and, and several members of our staff at CBU um, in addition to a representative from the engineering consulting firm that is a subject of our, our Second Amendment here, um, to go through in very specific detail all of the issues that um, we have identified with Duke as needing to be relocated so that these attorneys would understand and appreciate everything that needs to be accomplished uh, and then went through the timeline so that they could see um, how we got to where we are. After that meeting, then I had meetings with the attorneys individually, uh, just the attorneys, to discuss in greater detail the logistics and the legalities of what we're dealing with, make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, that letter I'm anticipating to see this week uh, in draft form so that we can make sure that it reads well before it goes out. Uh, that's kind of where we are right now. So that would be the first point of uh, interaction by McGimpsey into the process? With Duke, yes, that's correct. Okay, well, cr fingers crossed there, thank you. Yeah, so it, it's, gonna, it's gonna try and put some onus on them with regards to the burdens that they're going to create for us if they don't um, relocate. Um, we're going to go ahead and issue bids for the project, uh, Jane, is working on that right now to get the bid packet out with um, with uh, Donahue uh, to get that out so that uh, we can go ahead and get under contract and be ready to move. And that hopefully will put some burden on Duke to feel compelled to do something. Thank you. Sorry, Jane. <laughs> That's what it is. I Okay, any other questions for Jane? Okay, seeing none, then is there a motion to approve the second amendment to this agreement? So moved. Second. And Latrina, please call the roll. Commenter? Yes. Bannock? Yes. Eamon? Yes. Burnham? Yes. Kepler? Yes. Thurman? Yes. Okay, that second amendment is approved. Uh, next up, request for approval of a first amendment to the agreement with uh, Utility Financial Solutions, LLC on the water rate case and cost of service study test date change. And Laura Pettit is gonna talk with us. Hi, uh, good evening. So uh, we have been working with two companies. One of them is Utility Financial Solutions on the uh, water, utility cost of service study and rate case. Uh, we had planned to bring that to the board, then to council, then to the IURC. Um, this summer, it got postponed due to COVID. So when we looked at uh, postponing it into the beginning of next year, we realized that we were gonna have to adjust our test year. Uh, the original test year was gonna be the calendar year of 2019. Uh, now we're pushing it up from, um, March to of 20, April 1st of 2019 to March 30th, 31st of 2020. So, gosh, sorry. Um, so that's gonna require additional calculations from UFS to, uh, to do that update and um, 
recalculate the cost of service study. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, is there a motion to approve this amendment to this agreement with Utility Financial Solutions? So move. Second. And Latrina, please call the roll. Bannock? Yes. Parmenter? Yes. Burnham? Yes. Eamon? Yes. Kepler? Yes. Herman? Yes. Okay, that amendment is approved. Thank you. Uh, next, we have a request for approval of a first amendment to the agreement with Crow LLC for the water rate case and the COSS test date change. And Laura? Uh, hello, thank you. Um, so similar to UFS, we are engaged with Crow to work on the cost of service study and rate case for the water utility. Crow is the manager of the project. Utility Financial Solution is calculating the actual cost of service study. Um, so this amendment is to, again, update the test year um, and the, come up uh, with the new rate case for, for the water utility rate case. Sorry, I'm babbling. Uh, did you have any questions? Thanks, Laura. Any questions? All right, seeing none, uh, is there a motion for approval of this amendment to the agreement with Crow LLC? So move. Second. And Latrina? Eamon? I'm sorry, Eamon, yes. there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Panic? Yes. Kepler? Yes. Parmenter? Yes. Sherman? Yes. Burnham? Yes. Okay, that amendment is approved. Uh, item 10 on our agenda is being removed uh, because it's not quite ready for consideration yet. So I'm sure we'll see that in the future. Uh, item 11, request for approval of agreement with Hatch Company for an installation of water information management software. And James Hall will tell us about that. Hi, thank you, James Hall, uh, CBU Environmental. Um, the it, Hawk Company calls it a WIM system. Some of you may uh, have heard of a LIMS, a Laboratory Inter Integrated Management System. That's basically what this is. Um, we're going to integrate all three of our plants and in, including the service center. So we're going to create a, we're buying a database um, that will integrate all the laboratory information that we either are doing in our laboratories or a, have a third party lab doing. Um, and so it will bring in all that information and it also, um, will interact with our SCADA system to pull data from uh, the SCADA system to generate our um, regulatory compliance reports. And if you have any questions. Okay, any questions? Jeff. Yeah, what's the oper what's the maintenance cost on this? I mean, I see this in original outlay and I, I'm assuming some of it's consulting work to get us up and running. Uh, I'm just wondering what's the dollar amount every year after this? Uh, it includes three years um, in that cost. Uh, we went ahead and did that. I'm trying to get down to the, the contract to do it. it it's around three to five thousand um, dollars. Yeah, so uh, fifty two hundred dollars roughly per year. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for James? All right, seeing none, uh, is there a motion to approve this agreement? No move. Second. And Latrina, can you please call the roll? Parmenter? Yes. Eamon? Yes. Kepler? Yes. Vanek? Yes. Thurman? Yes. Burnham? Yes. All right, uh, that agreement's approved, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, old business. Any old business from the board? Uh, or old business? Yeah, I mean, oh, I wanted yes, to ask yeah. a question about this uh, uh, removal. I mean, this is old business. Remove the old, removal of the incinerator building. I mean, maybe my my well, my memory isn't that good, but I I think I remember that 
that um, someone else was going to pay for this removal. So are we, would we be, was that correct? And we're getting reimbursed for this when this comes forward? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, and any old business from staff? Follow up. Okay. Uh, any new business from the board? And new business from staff? None. All right, see none. Then uh, subcommittee reports, and I know the finance uh, committee met, and Vic, I think you're gonna talk with us about uh, the budget. Uh, yes, we presented our, uh, have presented our 2021 budget to the subcommittee. We met uh, with them two weeks ago, and then again today uh, to, uh, to discuss the budget uh, outline. Uh, all the board members have received a copy of the, um, budget memorandum to the mayor. That's also commun our communication to the, to the council. Uh, so uh, I've got a short presentation. I hope it's short uh, presentation to, to hit on the high points and talk about our goals for the coming year. And uh, then I'm happy to take any questions. And here we go. And this is supposed to work. So where is it? Did it come up? Yep. Yes. It's oh, amazing. Okay. Uh, as I said, this is our budget presentation for the for the coming year, 2021. Uh, we uh, this budget is very similar to the budgets for the for this year, uh, and we'll talk about uh, what our what our real objectives are, what our goals are right now, and where we are financially, as well. Um, hey, that didn't do anything. There we go. Uh, as you all know, the City of Bloomington Utilities exists to provide safe and sustainable water, wastewater, stormwater services in an economical manner, promoting prosperity and quality of life in our community. Um, our our uh, objective overall is to be recognized as the finest municipal water utility in Indiana. Uh, and I think we make progress on those goals every year. And uh, I think this uh, the picture you're looking at here reinforces that this is what our basins look like this year uh, as, as we've started using a chemical algicide uh, to, to, uh, to improve operations at the Monroe plant. It looks great. Um, at this time, CBU has 164 full-time and 19 hourly employees. Uh, they operate all three of our utilities with six interconnected divisions. On the waterworks, we have 25,299 active accounts. We operate the Monroe Water Treatment Plant, 420 miles of water mains, 3,064 fire hydrants. Uh, the sewer works has 22,574 connections, two treatment plants, 321 miles of collection mains, and uh, 8,400 manholes. And the stormwater utility has 101 miles of pipe and ditches and um, around 5,700 storm inlets. So it's a, a sizable operation that, of of both buried infrastructure and uh, operational facilities that we operate. In 2021, uh, our major initiatives are to continue our uh, improvements for water quality, uh, to replace water, continue our water main replacement program for water, uh, to do uh, some major investments in stormwater infrastructure. Those are all going to, uh, those are ongoing, but uh, we're really going to be taking on some big stuff in 21. Uh, modernizing CBU's internal processes, uh, taking uh, steps towards improving our uh, carbon footprint and climate action, and then, uh, all, as always, to work on improving the economic sustainability of the utility. Uh, for the last, uh, this is our second or third year that we've talked about the effective utility management framework. Uh, this was developed by the AWWA and the EPA and other organizations. Okay. Uh, basically, our uh, operations are divided into 10 activity areas. Those would be the, the little pizza wedges uh, inside the wheel on the picture here. Uh, product quality, operational optimization, employee and leadership development, financial viability, infrastructure, infrastructure strategy and performance, enterprise resiliency, customer satisfaction, stakeholder understanding and support, water resource sustainability, and community sustainability. Uh, for uh, the purpose of this presentation to manage the time, uh, we're only going to talk about 
the, the first five of these areas in detail. The rest of them are discussed in the memo. Product quality, uh, the activities description in general is to produce fit for purpose water and other recalibrated resources such as energy, nutrients, and biosolids that meet or exceed full compliance with regulatory and reliability requirements and consistent with customer public health, ecological, and economic needs. Uh, this is broken up into each of our different utilities. We have different goals in each utility. Uh, at the waterworks, when we talk about water quality, uh, obviously we're talking about meeting uh, or exceeding all those standards uh, for water quality. Uh, once again, we're going through another year where we're having uh, very little trouble with taste and odor complaints. Uh, the water tastes good all the time uh, for the last several years since we started feeding activated carbon. Uh, but we do uh, have the thing that we've had to deal with the most in recent years uh, is our program for reducing uh, disinfection byproducts. And our goal is 50 parts per billion for trihalomethanes, uh, 40 parts per billion for hal total haloacetic acids, which are, each of those is around two thirds of the regulatory standard. Uh, as you see from the graphs, uh, we've made a lot of progress in recent years and uh, some, some of the improvements we've made at Monroe this year, uh, where we've really got uh, this, we feel like we've got this uh, in, in control. So it's been great work by all the operators and the staff uh, in our operations divisions. On the sewer work side, uh, our, our treatment plant will operate 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, just as always without violating our NPDES discharge, discharge permits. Um, uh, at Blue Trip Pool, one of our big uh, product quality goals is to complete a local limit study uh, for the water, uh, the sewer shed that feeds the Blue Trip Pool plant. Uh, right now, we have an industrial discharge program only for the uh, the Dillman Road wastewater plant, uh, Blue Trip Pool. Uh, there's a significant development going on in that basin, especially now that we're going to be sending flow from the new hospital there. Uh, so uh, we're going to be taking this first step towards uh, building an industrial pretreatment program for the for that northern basin as well. Stormwater quality uh, is a very high priority for us. Uh, and one of the big efforts that's actually beginning this year, we'll finish next year, uh, will be the development of a stormwater master plan. This is going to cost around $200,000. Uh, we'll be soliciting stakeholder participation throughout uh, our stormwater system. And we'll be looking for the best ways we can find uh, to uh, improve stormwater quality and uh, get uh, every all of our stakeholders to participate with us in doing so. Uh, this will improve stormwater quality both in the city and downstream. And we expect to be doing significant investments in green stormwater infrastructure uh, as a result of uh, the master plan and as we work through it. Uh, for operational optimization, I don't think I need to read all of the words in that big long description, but uh, basically we're trying to use as little uh, resources as we possibly can uh, and to make uh, smart uh, data-driven decisions when we're uh, operating our facilities. Uh, this is a place where a lot of the, uh, the green initiatives uh, turn out to, to, to land because everything we do requires moving water around. Water's heavy, moving it up and down hills is expensive and takes a lot of energy. So um, when we talk about uh, anything we talk about in, in terms of uh, operational optimization uh, implicitly affects the carbon footprint of the city and of CBU. Uh, for all the utilities, we're going to be uh, continuing uh, developing analytical tools uh, to help us do uh, faster data-driven decisions. A lot of this work is being done uh, has uh, by uh, is being led by people in our admin division, uh, particularly our uh, uh, data analyst position that opened this year, uh, and also by uh, several teams that are working on a number of different efforts, for example, the, uh, the uh, uh, main break analysis team. Uh, we're also going to be working to expand the asset management program that's being built up this year to, for the linear infrastructure. Uh, we'll be adding in the three treatment plants uh, next year. So this is going to allow us to manage uh, 
uh, maintenance schedules and track inventory more effectively. Uh, also on the sewer works for operational optimization, by the end of the first quarter 2021, we'll complete uh, all of the upgrades to laboratory equipment. Uh, right now, uh, our ability to uh, monitor dissolved metals uh, is not as good as we'd want it to be. So we'll be able to, uh, by upgrading that equipment, we'll be able to, uh, we'll have a lower detection limit. We'll be able to tr track things at lower concentrations. We'll also be able to test for metals that we currently can't test for in-house. Also by the second quarter next year, uh, we'll be adding uh, cloud and mobile tracking software for sewage waste haulers. Uh, right now our waste haulers uh, are not, are basically they buy tickets and they don't. Um, we're going to be working to uh, develop a preferred pumper program that will help us reduce the amount of paperwork uh, and, and uh, also improve our, our tracking of the dumping of hauled waste into the, into the Dillman plant. For employee and leadership development uh, across the whole organization, uh, our goal is to recruit, develop, and retain a workforce that is competent, motivated, adaptive, and safety focused. Uh, this has uh, been a really high priority for us uh, ever since, um, ever since uh, I arrived here in 2015, and uh, we've um, and, and managed to improve uh, getting everybody who needs to be licensed, licensed, um, especially in TND. Um, and we've also uh, just been able to expand the amount of training we do overall for safety uh, and, uh, and all the other professional development activities that, that we do. Um, again, this year, uh, as the mayor has requested, we plan to invest one and a half percent of our personnel division budget in each division for professional training and development. This includes the operator training that helps uh, new employees get their licenses within a year of the day they were hired. Uh, also, uh, we are will be continuing in 2021 to assure that every work crew, every work site has at least one team member who is CPR certified at all times. Uh, and in 2021, we will uh, engage the senior CBU leadership in value stream mapping uh, to, uh, and we'll map four of our operational processes. And the goal here is to identify and remove waste and to improve our standard operating procedure documentation throughout the organization. The financial viability, uh, the uh, objective is to understand and plan for the full life cycle cost of utility operations and water resources. And a lot of the things we've been working on uh, this year, uh, and some of them have been delayed by COVID, uh, are things like the asset management system and uh, the, the approved SCADA system and the improved uh, laboratory information system. All of these things come together to uh, help us reduce our life cycle cost and act uh, more effectively uh, and more proactively uh, as time goes on. Uh, we will be using our asset management system to do an audit of our linear infrastructure, that's the water distribution system and the sewer collection system, uh, for all those capital assets in 2021. Uh, we're also going to competitively bid and award contracts for external laboratory services. Uh, this will uh, ensure we have competitive pricing um, and, and uh, we'll set up the procedures for doing automated entry of data test results into the laboratory information management system that you all just bought a few minutes ago. Also under financial viability, uh, something else we, we also have been talking about tonight already is the cost of service study and the rate review for the waterworks. Uh, we will bring a rate case to council in the first quarter 2021 and obviously to you as well. Uh, and that, uh, uh, once it's approved by council, it will go to the Indiana Utilities Regulatory Commission uh, with an expectation that any water rate increases would be implemented in early 2022. Infrastructure strategy and performance, another area that we've been uh, very aggressive about. Uh, this is maintaining and enhancing the condition of all the assets over the long term at the lowest possible life cycle cost and with acceptable risk consistent with customer community and regulatory approved service levels. Um, and on the water side, what that means uh, in a large part is the uh, uh, 
the water main replacement program that we've been doing since 2017. Uh, we spend $1.7 million per year on water main replacements. Uh, we, and typically we replace about two and a half miles of water mains. Uh, depending on revenue uh, and the timing of revenue, uh, next year uh, we expect to do most of that work in-house uh, in order to save costs. Um, but up to $1.7 million would be what we hope to spend next year on that. Uh, also, by the end of the third quarter of 2021, uh, in anticipation of the new lead and copper rule, we will be identifying all the lead service lines in our system. Uh, we anticipate it will take three to 15 years, depending on what we find out there, to replace all the remaining lead service lines. Uh, the Monroe plant will complete uh, the roof replacement for the main building by the third quarter of 2021. And we have about $4.4 million in additional projects, uh, especially uh, the installation of the belt press at the water plant uh, and the coating of the, uh, of the east tank. Uh, those projects we hope to uh, complete in 2021, again, depending on how the revenues come down. On the sewer works, uh, we anticipate being 70% complete uh, with the um, $23 million modernization and capacity improvement project at Dillman Road. That project began this year. Uh, it will take uh, another um, half a year beyond the end of 2021 to complete it. Uh, we will also complete the replacement of the sewer capacity expansion uh, for the uh, uh, in support of the new IU dormitories and other growth north of 17th Street. You may recall we uh, brought the engineering contract to the board for that project uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, that's approximately a $2 million project and IU will contribute 41% of the project costs. And also uh, on the sewer works, we will continue our sewer lining program, uh, hoping to line three to four miles of pipe and make other improvements to the collection system. Uh, for about $400,000 in 2021. But the big, uh, the, the major modernization project has an, an important uh, impact on our carbon footprint uh, because everything we do uh, uh, in that project is going to improve our overall operational efficiency, uh, especially when it comes to aeration and the, and the, way, we, the way we move air through the plant. So it's gonna be a real benefit to us. The stormwater utility by the end of 2021 will implement our strategies for the stormwater housekeeping according to the item standards. Uh, we do plan to continue the residential stormwater grant program uh, with a $75,000 budget. That's the same amount as this year. Uh, we also <coughs> anticipate completion of 50% of the Jordan River Tunnel uh, segment replacement project by the end of 2021. Uh, that's expected to cost around $12 million overall. Uh, it's a two-year project, and we hope it begins late this year. Also, in 2021, we'll begin a project to dredge the stormwater detention facilities at Miller Showers Park. Uh, it has not been dredged since it was constructed, and it's filling up with, with sediment, so we're going to need to clean it out. Now, just a few other highlights on our budget. Uh, we plan to increase the customer assistance program uh, to $50,000 uh, with the expectation that we uh, may have additional demand on that program uh, as the pandemic unfolds. Uh, we, uh, as I mentioned, we have their major investments that we're making at the Dillman Road plant and the Jordan River Tunnel. So these are the three big uh, items in terms of uh, budgets for 2021. Uh, overall, our budget, uh, our budget summary is that uh, we're anticipating a revenue uh, decrease of around 7%. That's um, manifest as seven and, and three quarters percent on the sewer side, more like six on, uh, sorry, on the water side, more like six on the sewer side and, and three or so on the stormwater side. Uh, this is all related to um, metered use primarily. Um, the way this will all manifest out uh, will be that uh, primarily we will reduce the amount of money that's available for uh, extensions and replacements. So uh, when you look at the waterworks budget, uh, budget change, there's about a 1% uh, 
uh, increase in personnel services anticipated. Uh, a lot of that's because of the union contract increase uh, for union employees, but uh, that also can be some staffing uh, changes. Uh, for selling less water, we use less supplies. So we'll be spending a little bit less there as well. Um, and the ENR, as I pointed out a moment ago, we anticipate would be significantly reduced uh, in order to uh, uh, to balance everything out. So um, I know um, one of our board members is new to this, so I'll just explain uh, what we do when we budget is we budget every anticipated dollar of revenue. Uh, we base the, the 100s for personnel, the 200s for supplies, and the 300s uh, for other services other than ENR. Um, and uh, the water sinking fund, that's the the uh, principal and interest on our bonds, uh, those, those dollars are all uh, budgeted based on uh, anticipated expenditures. Whatever's left gets budgeted as ENR, uh, and that's the money that we have available for doing various projects uh, in improving and plant improvements and so forth. And you will see here uh, on the 400s, the water sinking fund, you see the reduction there that is related to the refunding of the, of the water bonds that the board did earlier this year. So all in all, uh, this turns, we're anticipating around seven and three quarters percent change uh, downward in our overall water budget. On sewer, uh, it's a similar, uh, similar story with a reduction of around six and a quarter percent. Uh, that's because some of our sewer customers are not also water customers. So, uh, some of the customers, uh, uh, the uh, uh, since they're not water customers, we don't anticipate uh, as much reduction over there. But uh, you will see again a uh, reduction in anticipated ENR spending uh, in the coming year based on uh, the 2020 number. The stormwater utility, we're expecting a, a decrease overall of about 3.45%. Uh, and it's distributed as it's shown here in the table. This budget is a much smaller budget than uh, the other budgets, but the, the big expenditures that's going to be coming up uh, will be the, uh, uh, the change in our sinking fund for the, the, uh, the bonding for the Jordan River Tunnel. So I'll just conclude by saying that the, the 20, this budget uh, request reflects, reflects increases and also decreases that uh, align with the goals of uh, improving our water quality, completing smart meters, replacing water mains, reinvigorating the stormwater program, and modernizing a bunch of our internal processes. Uh, thanks a lot for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions. And I also want to thank uh, uh, the, the folks who contributed imagery that, that uh, showed up in here, uh, Don, App, Don Adams, Dave Askins, and all the city staff who, uh, who make wonderful images and photographs of uh, the various things we do. I'd also like to thank uh, Latrina Harrington and Laura Pettit and Holly McLaughlin for uh, all the massive amount of help uh, they uh, always put into preparing this presentation. Uh, I'm fortunate to be the one who gets to present it. So uh, thank you all, and um, I welcome any questions you have. Thank you so much, Vic. Um, that was a great presentation, and thanks to everyone who contributed to it. Um, let's see, I see Jason, you have a question or comment? Yes, uh, so a couple of things. Um, so uh, Vic, it was, maybe my memory fails me, and if some other board members who were, have been around for a while help refresh me. It didn't come from this administration, but in one of the prior administrations, I could have sworn that we were told that there were no lead service lines that were left in the system. So, um, well, I, I certainly never said it. Um, the, um, our practice is that when we encounter one, we remove it and replace it. Uh, but uh, there are some out there, uh, not as many as there once were. But uh, this year will be, uh, uh, in the coming year, we'll be undergoing a really aggressive search to find any that are left. Okay, so, I mean, anyone on the spot, but Jeff, do you remember hearing that at some point? 
Um, when so we, when you say uh, service lines, you're talking about lines that City of Bloomington owns, not from the meter to the house. That's what's what we mean. It's the line that goes from the main to the meter. Yeah. No, I was not aware at all that we had lead service lines. Yeah. So I mean, we don't have to get into that, you know, now. But I'd be interested to have more information because I seem to recall explicitly being told at one point years ago that we didn't have any in our system. Well, I'll definitely look into that. I, okay. I have the same recollection. I, I'm surprised. Well, again, my memory is the same as yours, Jason. But but yeah, I'm surprised to hear that, and and certainly you know know that it's a priority and 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 want it to be a priority to to, um, you know, ahead of other, some other projects, I would think, given the health risks to address those, those lines, as we find out about them, it, you know, I, I understand that we may not know about all of them, but as soon as we would find out about them, it seems to me that would be a very high priority for addressing. Well, we do, when we encounter one in the field, we do replace it. So then the second, um, question I had was about the customer assistance program. So um, a couple questions on that. Is that, is that $50,000 funded by the rate payers or is that source of funding from some other uh, city fund? It's funded from the rate payers. Okay, and so does the IURC regulate how much we can, we can allocate to a fund like that? The IURC is uh, of course aware of the program uh, and uh, they have not, we're not funding it. We've never funded it at a level that uh, they raised any issues. A lot of utilities do have similar kinds of programs uh, to, to help uh, people who are unable to pay because of their economic circumstances. Right, well, I was looking, um, while we were on the call here, I've got my Duke bill and I'm looking at it and they have a line there for uh, add here to help others contribution to the helping hand program. So yeah. I mean, that's one thing that we might might think about is maybe voluntary individual participation fund like that. Um, I'd also be interested to know if, in fact, the IURC does put any on how much how much of that we can we can we can fund with ratepayer money. And then the last part of that question, um, also on the fund, is how do we determine need? You know, what's the priority? Is it, uh, you know, what does someone have to do to qualify uh, for that fund? Well, we don't determine it. Uh, what what happened is that the when this program was established, the board set set uh, guidelines. I don't remember uh, the details of them, Laura might, uh, but it's all administered by the South Central Community Action Program. So okay. basically, if someone contacts us, uh, we have them contact SCAP. Uh, SCAP reviews, does all the uh, review, and then uh, when they approve it, we pay the bill, basically. Um, you, one thing you can't do is get customer assistance money after you're disconnected. So we very, uh, we're very uh, aggressive at working with customers who get into the rears to help them get on a payment plan or reach out to SCAP before they get disconnected. Now, obviously, right now, we're not doing disconnections at all. But the, under normal circumstances, um, you know, we we try to make sure everybody gets these things settled before they get a dis disconnect notice. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Oh, Jeff. Yeah. Um, so, easy question first: the stormwater budget. Uh, why would it be reduced if it's, you know, fee based and property based? Laura? Um, it is based on the number of active accounts we have. Um, and so we're just seeing less accounts. Oh, so there are um, accounts that are being shut off due right. to the, the, um, the health um, Right. Emergency. Yeah. Okay. I understood. That makes sense now. Um, okay. So for the replacements, um, 2.5 miles of water mains, three to four miles of sewer lines. And I'm wondering, you know, bigger picture, uh, given the age and the life expectancy, and I know you guys have formulas to look at this. Um, 
are we budgeting enough to keep up with uh, the, the maintenance that needs to occur? And if not, um, are, are we considering that in these rate increases as we move forward? And do we have a plan to catch up if we are behind? Well, that's a great question. Um, and and I've, I've asked the same question a number of times myself. Um, the way uh, the, the $1.7 million for water main replacement was established in 2016, it was, uh, uh, it was in the, when I first came here, that was the amount that was in that first rate case that we did uh, in 2016. So that all started just days after I got here. And uh, that, those numbers had already been arrived at at that point. Um, we have been doing analysis. You know, we, we didn't know what $1.7 million would do uh, at the time because uh, in Bloomington, Replacing water mains is really expensive. They have to be buried four feet deep. Um, you can, you, you know, there are very few places in the city of Bloomington where you can go four feet without hitting rock. So depending on how much rock, the cost of replacing a mile of pipe, uh, an awful lot of it depends on how much rock you have to break to lay that, that mile of pipe. Because when you put in a new water main, you can't just put it where the old one was because you have to keep that one in service until the new main is in place. So what you usually end up doing is laying a new main adjacent to the one that you're replacing and then, uh, and then disabling the, the old one. So you don't have, it's, it, it makes it more expensive than it might have been had we been in Indianapolis or Martinsville or something like that. So what we've learned through experience is we can, we can replace about two and a half miles per year. Um, that turns out to be a replacement schedule of mm, 400 years, something like that. Right? So it's not fast enough. These pipes are expected to last 50 to 100 years typically. So um, we've been doing some analysis. Uh, engineering's done a lot of work on this in the last year uh, to look at um, what it would cost, how many miles of pipe would it cost to replace um, over the next, the next rate cycle to reduce um, the amount of, uh, of highly uh, susceptible uh, or pipes that are highly susceptible to main breaks in the next four to 10 years. And that's, they've, count, they've come up with new numbers and it's round numbers. Brad, help me here. What was the, uh, the number we came up with? But when we do the rate case, we put a larger number, was it 5.3 or, or something? I think it was something like that uh, in the number, in the the justification for the rate case that we'll be bringing in the spring. So, and that's specifically guided towards prioritizing sections of our distribution system that are most at risk of having significant main breaks at this time. So I, I like that approach, but, but still it sounds like we need to do more. And I remember this, I asked the same question four years ago, whenever it was, and, and the answer was no, it's not enough. And, and um, it, it would be, we, we need to get to that point, you know, yes, and, and um, wh whatever the costs are, because it's going to cost a lot more if we don't do it. So, and I know we can't lay a giant increase at one time, but we've gone to this new two-year incremental um, increase, and we should, uh, should try to factor that in as soon as we can. Yeah, and we're working as fast as we can to do that. The same way with sewer lining and, and sewer replacements. We've I've been doing uh, more analysis of, of where we have the biggest issues with I and I, and and with an eye towards all of that. So it's it's all in there. Thank you. Hey Vic, um, I, following up on on uh, Jeff's comments, um, if if our federal government were to set a priority on investing in water utilities and, and infrastructure replacement and upgrades um, at a level that we really need across the nation, um, because lots of municipalities are, are dealing with what we are as well. Um, uh, and let's say suddenly there was enough money to really you know, uh, replace the number of miles of pipes, uh, water mains that we need to. Um, uh, do we have the the crews to be able to to keep up with that? Um, would that be an expansion of of staff to to do it? 
it would either be depending on the the period of time if it were a program that wound up and went on for 20 years and then wound down i think you could manage uh, and administer the growth of the crews uh, of staff and and, re, and the eventual elimination of that staff i think you could manage that simply by attrition if it were a long enough period of time if it were a five-year period i think we'd be hiring contractors so we Mm -hmm. uh, but we may bring contractors in and have them housed in our facilities, for example, and then we can accelerate it. And we have done uh, some of the bigger projects that we've done uh, for water main replacement have actually been done by outside contractors. Um, uh, one notable one was the, the North Old State Road 37 project. And mm -hmm. basically the approach we've been taking is if it's if the project is happening in a, say, a lesser traveled portion of town uh, where there's not a lot of traffic and the logistics of just executing the project are, are conducive um, to it, uh, we'll do that one in-house. Uh, so Eastern Heights, we did that way, and a number of other smaller ones we've done that way. Um, the problem is that our crews have to be available to do things like water main breaks and and you know, go out and clean inlets when it's getting ready to rain and those kinds of things. So um, if we're doing a project like on Arlington Road, we did a project on Arlington Road or the old North State Road 37 project. Uh, in a case like that, you know, the, the, the logistical issues that would come up when everybody got off the job and drove away to go repair a main break, uh, that would certainly not be a good situation. So projects that uh, have a significant impact on traffic or other issues that that uh, that we don't want to have be in a situation where people can't walk off the, the project for a time. Uh, those we have; those are the ones we contract out. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, any other questions or comments? Not seeing any. Okay. Thank you again for that great presentation. Um, and then next up are the, uh, oh, wait, um, I think we needed to hear from the finance committee about any recommendations on the budget. Is that right? That's right. Yes. So the finance committee met today, Sherman, Burnham, and Parmenter, and we were updated to any changes since the last presentation. And we voted after the presentation to um, recommend to the whole board uh, approval of the 2021 budget. Okay, thank you. And so um, at this point, do we need to uh, take a vote on approval and recommendation uh, to take this then to council? So uh, is there a motion to uh, approve the uh, budget as presented tonight uh, and recommend that to city council? So moved. Second. And Latrina, can you please call the roll? Sherman? Yes. Janet? Yes. Burnham? Yes. Eamon? Yes. Sapler? Yes. Parmenter? Yes. All right. Uh, so the budget is presented, is approved at this end. Thank you very much. And next up, we have staff reports. Uh, so, Vic. Hi, it's me again. Um, I just uh, wanted to talk uh, during staff reports. Uh, Jean requested, and I had planned on it uh, ahead of time as well, to talk about uh, the COVID cases that we've had uh, at CBU uh, and what we've been doing. Uh, uh, some of you may know I just came back today from vacation. Um, on the Sunday after I left, which was two weeks ago yesterday, um, I got a call that uh, we'd had a positive test uh, in TND. And you may recall about three weeks ago, we had a positive test uh, amongst the, the meter crew, uh, with a meter reader. Uh, after that test, uh, uh, contracts were traced, but uh, we didn't have any other, uh, anything related to, to that particular case come up. Um, the case that uh, was an issue that we learned of uh, two weeks ago yesterday uh, uh, was a, a person in the TND division. Uh, we uh, uh, contract tracing was conducted, and a number of other people were tested. Uh, four days later, we learned that two 
uh, people who were on that same crew had also tested positive. Uh, all this was in the paper. Uh, they had also tested positive. Um, before that second set of tests came back, uh, well, right after we learned of the of the first case in TND two weeks ago yesterday, uh, we reinstated the operational practices in TND that we've been using back in March, uh, where uh, uh, Brandon divided uh, everything into two crews, uh, two shifts. One comes in at 6:30 and leaves at 2:30. The other comes in at 7:30 and leaves at 3:30. Uh, so to that cuts the population in the garage in half uh, at any given time. And additionally, um, directed the uh, line people and the assistant superintendents to be the only ones who actually come into the garage. Everyone else meets either outside or at the job site. So uh, uh, this is to try and maximize distancing inside the garage. Uh, we got the second uh, set of results the following Thursday. Uh, at that point, uh, we uh, decided to uh, reinstate those March practices for the rest of CBU and ask all employees who could work from home to do so uh, to make sure that we didn't, uh, because we didn't want to get in a situation where uh, we had an outbreak breaking out throughout the building. And we wanted to monitor what happened with those additional tests. Uh, fortunately, we haven't had another positive test in TND. Uh, either with that crew or with one of the other crews since then, which is great news. Um, last week, we did have an additional case uh, that was again in meter service. Uh, we uh, had the tracking was done and up to now we've learned of no other uh, issues with that one. So um, uh, we're uh, pretty confident that we didn't end up with uh, community transmission inside the garage or inside the service center. Uh, and uh, you know, we've been very, very cautious about this. Um, Brandon has uh, been working with his crews and Tom's been working with the folks in the plants to make sure that everyone is practicing social distancing, uh, wearing masks uh, when they need to. Uh, I can vouch for at least two of the crews that I went out and visited with this morning that all had, uh, they all had masks or uh, the gaiters up over their faces when they were working in proximity to one another. And uh, we're being as assertive about this as we possibly can. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're proud of our employees that are out there doing it right uh, and setting a good example for the community. And we will continue to encourage um, proper distancing and proper behavior uh, and proper response to the COVID uh, pandemic. So we're doing, we're doing what we can and we're always open to new suggestions and we monitor this uh, every day. Thank you, Vic. Uh, any uh, questions or comments? Um, I am wondering, um, uh, is there any discussion, and I don't even know if at this point our, our state um, or nation has the capacity to do it, but is there any discussion of regular routine testing of CBU employees to catch any asymptomatic cases um, that folks might not be aware of. I know um, the IU plan for students returning is to have all students and, and staff and faculty tested on a regular basis. There just isn't that much capacity in Monroe County. We do have a number of employees who have gone and uh, had precautionary tests. For example, uh, they were going to have uh, grandparents coming to visit grandkids and those kinds of things. A lot of people have been taking advantage of testing for that. Some people have uh, have gone uh, through the testing program uh, uh, because they were just wanting to make, be sure uh, for, for whatever mm -hmm. reason, or maybe they were con just concerned about it. Um, but the capacity for testing in Monroe County just isn't that large. And mm -hmm. uh, and by the time you get a result back, it might be a week or more, more before you know. So uh, at this point, we don't have a plan to do that. Uh, the city really hasn't discussed uh, any kind of you know, blanket testing programs with, you know, with all of our employees. Um, and even if we did, I don't know that we could execute it at, the, you know, at a level that would be sufficient to really, to really track it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's just so frustrating because that's like one of the keys to you know, preventing um, uh, community transmission within an employment site and then within the broader community. And, and I know that um, 
IU has is, is come up with uh, some, initially some contracts with other companies to do testing for all of their students and, and staff. And then they're developing their own testing regimen in their labs. Um, and so I don't know if there are any municipalities or employers that are um, investigating contracts with particular labs to be able to do kind of their own testing that way. Um, and I don't either. One thing okay. we are discussing, uh, board member Bannock brought this to my attention some weeks ago, but we are continuing to investigate uh, the potential for sampling of wastewater. We have actually taken some wastewater samples and we're sending them off to a lab. Uh, we uh, um, are investigating the, the prospects for that as a, as a community-wide kind of screening uh, regimen, uh, but we aren't, we aren't there yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And um, just a, a particular question, uh, in terms of crews that are going out uh, to work, and uh, I know early on there was some discussion about sharing vehicles and how that should be handled in terms of minimizing chance of um, passing the virus uh, between crew members in the same truck. Um, how is that being handled at this point? Uh, if two people are in the same vehicle, they're masked. Okay. Okay, great. So, any other questions, concerns? Okay. And that's all I and have, thank you. That's it, all right. Thanks so much, Vic, for that update. Um, and I hope everybody's recovering fine and, and uh, being okay. So um, let's see. Uh, uh, oh, Holly, I forgot to uh, warn the public that uh, if there were any petitions and communications, uh, to put those into uh, our Facebook Live um, comments section. Um, are there any uh, petitions and communications from the public? Um, no questions via Facebook. Okay, thank you. And next meeting, I will remember to give that reminder a little earlier. Um, okay, uh, then I uh, is there a motion for us to adjourn for tonight? So move. All right, we are adjourned. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a good evening.